gravitational wave to some extent. Then obviously your laser beam is uh, noisy, and so even if the best mass has no acceleration, you, th you think there is an acceleration because your laser beam is noisy. And third one, which uh, in over the last few years was the one that uh, really important in the other part of is that you think you're measuring, I mean the measurement is perfect if you measure uh, the distance within the center of mass of these bodies, but in reality you're measuring the distance between two points, and so if these bodies move uh, without, uh, uh, you know, accelerating one relative to the other, but just by rotating, you also detect the signal. <laughs> and so more or less all the disturbances fall in one of these three categories. Um, instrument people like to describe the things that input and output, so you may say, there is real motion of these test masses, relative motion of the test masses that have different sources, uh, forces or traditional ways of uh, uh, picking up the motion of the spacecraft, and then there is a, a, an output signal that adapts to everything, but people like to describe everything as an equivalent acceleration. And so if you uh, describe the performance needed for this in terms of uh, effective acceleration unit, uh, you get this red line here, and at low frequency you're dominated by real motion of test mass. And uh, the requirement for Lisa is that this number is very small. Uh, when I did the uh, talk to a uh, non specialized audience, uh, 10 to minus 15 meter per, se per second square is the force of a virus uh, on, on, on the ground, right? It's the force of gravity on the hurt of a, of a particle of the size of a virus. Uh, and then at higher frequency, uh, this razor here is, the, is due to the, uh, to the noise of, the, of your uh, readout, motion readout, that when converted to an acceleration has this characteristic razor uh, that goes with frequency squared. So the idea of, of Pathfinder is to test this basic complement of Lisa. So you take one Lisa link. Uh, you take one spacecraft and you squeeze the link into one spacecraft because you're, you're after testing the, the basic link and you, to some extent, you can do without the time in the kilometer. So you put in a spacecraft, this is the Lisa Pathfinder spacecraft, roughly a year ago. It's now a bit more rocked into uh, its thermal tanks. Uh, you need a propulsion module because uh, we want to go into an interplanetary orbit and with the kind of launcher we can get hold of, we need a, a propulsion module to get to the L1, um, one of these L1 orbits, which is more or less in the same interplanetary environment as it is. Um, so the, uh, the way we obtain squeezing a 5 million kilometer arm into one spacecraft is basically we remove this link. This link is removed, uh, but we keep these two links. So you have a test mass, spacecraft and test mass, and uh, you can combine this interferometer, but basically you have these two links, and you test a lot, and you do this with a nominal uh, LISA artwork, so you obtain both of measuring the physics behind the disturbances and to uh, test why uh, the critical component. And so the basic complement of this other finder that 90% um, of the audience knows better than I do, is two test masses, free floating, no contact to the spacecraft, with an interferometer in between, measuring the relative velocity of the relative distance of the relative acceleration to the Earth. Um, and the, uh, the declared uh, uh, requirement of the mission is to demonstrate that you can set two test masses in free fall with relative acceleration in, in this range, which is less than a factor seven, it's not a factor ten, because in terms of differential acceleration, uh, LISA require a, a four, not a three, in 10 to minus 15 meter per second squared. So a factor uh, roughly seven of LISA at some frequency which is higher uh, uh, than the entire range of LISA, because obviously testing at very low frequency is expensive and you don't want the mission to cause a problem. But still, we have a goal to demonstrate to make at least the measurement at, at the low frequencies. And, and so you see there is a gap. And uh, part of the talk is to show the hardware we find, and part of the talk is to uh, tell you about the rationale to fill up this gap between the, the requirement of Lisa but finder and the goal of Lisa. Uh, this is taken from the recent Decadal survey, so you probably know these few graphs. 
this Rush are making the point of, uh, of, yeah, I mean, testing the physics is very nice, but we do a flight test of the LISA hardware and we try to fly the hardware as nominal as you can. Uh, and uh, if you list the things, the technology that LISA need, uh, the one in red are uh, the ones that are somehow tested on Pathfinder, some very, very close to the LISA requirement, some a little bit in a more uh, uh, remote way. And so I'll go a little bit through this thing and give you uh, uh, an overview of uh, the element of this list of uh, devices. So first, the test mass, we obviously try the test mass. Nominally, this is the same test mass of LISA. Here we made a little compromise with the time and schedule. It's a special alloy, very low magnetic susceptibility, very dense uh, because it's a, uh, it's a gold platinum. And I would say the main reason for gold platinum is the density that makes this a very heavy object. It's a very counterintuitive when you try to lift this little cube and it, it really weighs a lot. Uh, the shape over the years has become sophisticated. This is not the final one, it's a model of this, but it carries a lot of features uh, for caging the test mass at launch. We obviously carry an interferometer uh, to do the measurement of the relative acceleration. So this is not nominally used the hardware, but I, I'll come back to that. This is needed to do the, uh, the most important measurement. It's a nominal, this interferometer is a test mass to test mass interferometer. But when you analyze the disturbances, the fact that the light gets reflected over components that are fixed to your spacecraft uh, it basically consists of combining in, in uh, analogically two measurement of distances between the test mass and the optical bench, which is fixed to the spacecraft, and this test mass to the optical bench. Uh, as I said, this is not part of LISA. However, the technology to build this is the same as LISA. This is a wonderful picture from Glasgow. Uh, this is the mounting of uh, the optical component with this hydroxy catalysis technique. And the result is uh, basically a monolithic device like you had carved it from block of uh, zero to. The stability is outstanding. I think uh, as uh, Harry Ward was saying this morning in our meeting, there is no option for this uh, high stability uh, structure than to bond the component with this uh, a special technique that basically restores the bond of the ceramic and so makes it really monolithic. And you see here, this is the flat model or the spare, or one of the two coming up. And so uh, it gives you an impression on how, while well, this is an engineering model that has been uh, instrumental to do the testing and develop the technology. Uh, the scheme of the, of the optics has now been tested end to end. Uh, you see here, the, one is the laser and the other one is the acoustic optic modulator and the engineering model of our optical bench with the device that mimic the test mass and there has been an end-to-end -end test of this. These are engineering model of the electronics, two pieces of electronic. Uh, this is the uh, the back end of the interferometer and I think this is the face meter but I'm not sure. And anyhow we have the flight of this electronics so I try to give you a flavor of where we are in terms of development. Um, uh, as I said, interferometer is not that of LISA, it's not the 5 million kilometer interferometer of LISA, uh, but uh, it's, it can be, and I will show you, can be used for the local measurement of the test mass of the spacecraft as in LISA, and, uh, and the performance is the same as in LISA, as you see, this is picometer per root third, and so uh, at high frequency, uh, it's uh, better than, than 10 picometer per root third, is even much better at the intermediate frequency, and it's so good at low frequency that we now use it as a reference for the drug free. And this is a recent measurement uh, at AEI and ASRM that shows that this thing, unfortunately, the, uh, the resolution of the projector cuts the scale, but basically these are uh, 100 microns, or a bit more than 100 microns, and that's the beauty of the heterodyne uh, interferometer that allow you to follow this test mass and the motion through the system for almost half a millimeter while uh, a normal dynamic interferometer would have done it. Uh, everything is accommodated in an ultra stable structure, so everything is zero do. We really like zero do here, and uh, uh, this has been vibrated and demonstrated that uh, it survives. Unfortunately, I don't have the movie of the vibration, which is pretty impressive for a piece of glass. Uh, 
So it's um, easy to say you take two test masses and interferometer. In reality, there are complications. Uh, you want this test mass to uh, fall freely, and so you want that. And the spacecraft has no mechanical contact to the, to the test mass, so you have to resort to the scheme of uh, doing drag free navigation. I'll come back in a second to that. Uh, you have to, because you have no mechanical contact to the spacecraft, you have to discharge the test mass that otherwise kept. Uh, keeps charging up because of the cosmic rays, and uh, it, and because you have this test mass rattling in the spacecraft at launch, you have to block it, and this proves to be one of the most challenging tasks, much more than uh, proving geodesic flight or Einstein stuff and so on. Uh, vacuum in space is not it's not good vacuum, so you need a pump, uh, at least not on on a short uh, duration mission. And zero G is not zero G on board the spacecraft, and so you have to do something about your static gravitational field. And I'll go through this trick. Um, as I say, uh, the test mass has to freely fall, while the spacecraft has to surround the test mass without touching it, because uh, any mechanical contact, even a, a tiny wire used in space accelerometer, is too big a disturbance. And so what you do is that well, there is a line missing here, but basically. With this local interferometer, you measure the position of the spacecraft relative to this test mass, and you turn on and off, or actually you continuously activate your uh, macro-Newton thruster to keep the spacecraft centered on the test mass. And this is a, it's not a technique invented for uh, Lisa Pathfinder. It's an old technique known as drag-free, used mostly to compensate for uh, the atmosphere drag, and here it's used to compensate for uh, the solar pressure drag and so on. And so you need a local interferometer, and this local interferometer is, uh, can be, or it's uh, potentially the same as you use in LISA to do the measurement of the test mass of the spacecraft. And so we carry an interferometer that also measures the test mass uh, to the position of the test mass of the actual things. We carry this macro-Newton thrusters, and we carry a computer to do this closer control loop. And when we say macro-Newton thruster, you, you have to notice the scale of this. This is not an hydrogen thruster, right? This is a, it's giving, uh, again, micro-Newton, and uh, the operating regime is probably around 50 micro-Newton. Uh, the mission carries uh, a set of thrusters from ESA with a computer to do the drug free, but also carries uh, a, a NASA mission, SD7, who uses the same uh, test masses and interferometer, but have separated uh, thrusters and computer, and this has uh, really has been delivered, and the uh, performance of the thrusters have been measured, and they are uh, within the requirement pretty excited. Uh, then you have to control this test mass in all degrees of freedom. Uh, there is no way you can leave it free in, in the degrees of freedom you're not controlling. Okay, you're following the test mass with your spacecraft along this line, but along all the other lines you have to uh, carry your test mass with you, and so you with electrodes, you apply forces. And if you notice this the intent of this cartoon is to show that you're never moving the test mass along this direction, but you're continuously uh, carrying the test mass with the spacecraft. So the test mass is surrounded by electrodes, and the electrodes are used to apply forces to the test mass, and also to read the position of the test mass in all degrees of freedom where you don't have a laser. And here you see the gadget that carries all the electrodes, we call it uh, the Gravity reference sensor, the GRS, and this is called the electrode housing. It's a box that carries the electrode that, again, are used to sense the position and the test mass and rotation and attitude and test mass in all direction, and also to apply forces whenever it's needed. Obviously, it's easy to say, but then it becomes complicated. It's all uh, low capacitance uh, measurements, and, uh, it's, uh, and you see here uh, the dressing of uh, the device. Uh, for the converter, uh, there is a big difference between uh, sensing the position of test mass with electrode in very low field, and one thing is uh, uh, doing a space accelerometer like the one that are flying on Grace or Ghost. The main difference is that here the, the name of the game is don't touch the test mass, right? Because that's your geodesic reference, and so uh, stay as much as you can away from your test mass, and so. If you, if you could read this, it, it tells you that the test mass is surrounded by gaps of many millimeters, four millimeters. We would have logged many kilometers, but obviously we cannot fit 
kilometers and, we, and uh, the electrostatic force will not be so this is a compromise within still having a decent electrostatic force from the electrode but uh, staying away from test mass uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the test mass is the end mirror of an optical device so uh, the, the kind of accuracy needed in assembling this thing is uh, tens of microns and you see here stages of assembling on a quartz mandrel to get the, the precision as I said, you need vacuum because the mission is too short and the knowledge about vacuum and water spacecraft is not sufficient. And so we carry a vacuum house and with a, a getter pump in it. And uh, this is the same as we plan to do in Lisa. And obviously this uh, creates a complication because now this is a device which is part of an optical uh, uh, scheme, but it's also a big vacuum enclosure and you have to uh, uh, practice aligning Aligning things like this is an example to align the entire GRS to the optical bench to, to mine. Uh, the front end electronics, you see here the ELM uh, assembled on the spacecraft. Uh, you don't need much resolution uh, from this uh, capacity sensor, nanometer is okay, uh, provided you stay away. And uh, we got the requirement that this is the same electronic in LISA. So I don't know if I made it uh, clear, but all what you're saying here, 90% of what you're saying here is the same hardware as Lisa. We have, as I said, we have to discharge the test mass. We cannot touch the test mass. We cannot put a wire to ground. And so the way we, and the test mass keeps charging because there are cosmic rays. So it charges even in the lab, right? You don't need to go to space uh, to get this cosmic rays. And, uh, and so to discharge, you shine UV light on metal surfaces to extract electrons. And the trick here, is that deciding on which surface you shine the light, uh, uh, you, you get electrons either toward the test mass or from the test mass. And you see here the flight model of the lamps uh, uh, that have to discharge. And we have shown that indeed in some condition, at least, we can uh, uh, decide, I mean, here there is a scale that you don't see that is volts, right? And uh, this point is zero volts, so you don't need any bias. And just by regulating the illumination, either on the test mass or the electrode, you can cross the zero and neutralize the test mass at your will, to some extent. Uh, there is a, there's been a lot of work done on uh, uh, estimating how much charge is going to accumulate on the test mass, and all this work will be tested on Pathfinder and is uh, directly relevant to this. Uh, the KG mechanism, I think the next question. <laughs> KG mechanism is one of the main problem of, uh, in terms of schedule and, uh, and cost. I mean, uh, it's a complicated mechanism to, to lock the test mass at launch. Uh, it's a three-stage motor because uh, you have the problem of locking at launch, but also you have the problem to deliver to a system that have to capture the test mass with a very low force authority, which is coming from this electrode that many millimeters from the test mass. So it's a three-stage, uh, pretty sophisticated mechanism, and the central part, the one that releases the test mass, is ready and has been delivered. Uh, but the big locking scheme has got some uh, manufacturing problem and has been our latest source of delay. Um, you have to fly, I mean, you cannot really fly in zero G. Uh, in reality, in the, the, the way the spacecraft is assembled gives you 10 to minus 8 G. This is too big. I mean, if you have to compensate 10 to the 8 G with an electric field, you may you end up making too much noise. And so we, we have a task of reducing the gravity field that the test mass plays to 0.1 nano G, 10 to minus 9 meter per square, second square. And this is made with a compensation mass, but obviously the complicated thing is that you have to weight every tank and you have to have a mechanical model of everything because you have to calculate the gravitation field on board generated by any source on board the spacecraft uh, to this accuracy. And so we, we have the prime of the mission holds a, a gravitational control protocol where any supplier has to uh, uh, swear on the, on the weight of the device and the mass distribution of the device. And that's uh, something that also Lisa needs and uh, this would be a demonstration of that same technique. And so you see, for instance, that on the spacecraft there are marks at, at this distance, uh, a centimeter accuracy in mounting thing is enough and so there are marks and there are taken pictures because the location of the virus device is, uh, is uh, critical. So up to now is okay we find this hardware. 
Now this is the second scope, of, uh, the second goal of the mission, which is to confirm the physical model of the disturbances that are uh, really pushing the test masses out of their geodesic trajectory. So the sector here is the true motion of the test mass. What are the disturbances that uh, uh, pull the test mass uh, out of the geodesic trajectory and so mimic gravitational wave? And the reason why we want to confirm this physical model, we want to have a, a quantitative model, is that we, we use this model, we will use this model to extrapolate to this, and I will show you uh, what I mean with that. And also, I would say we're learning now that also we will need this model to reduce the data from LISA and to clean up the data from level zero to level one data and clean up all the systematics that can reduce the sensitivity of LISA. And so the, the real plan of LISA Pathfinder is a full menu of experiment to uh, measure all the uh, disturbances, and this is just a compressive list. And uh, the way the mission works is that uh, in Roughly 90 days of mission plus 80 days of the uh, DRS operation, the uh, NASA operation. Uh, those those 90 days are um, divided in various investigations. Each investigation can take uh, multiple of 24 hours and is made of different experiments. And, uh, uh, and the team is working hard to uh, analyze those investigation, predict the sensitivity predict what is the accuracy with which we will measure all the parameters and convert that into a sequence command to the space. And, and when I uh, say uh, com uh, test the physical model of the disturbances, I mean that we have a physical model of the acceleration disturbances, so the real forces uh, shaking the test mass. We have a model of the errors in the optical uh, device. We have also a model of the geometrical imperfection that makes the system pick up the motion, not of the test masses, but, the, but of the spacecraft, for instance. And we would like to put a final number uh, or a final um, uh, formula in all these boxes, at least uh, with a mix of the mission in flight and some parallel experimentation on ground. And the idea is that wherever is possible, you try to assess uh, to measure the transfer function from uh, any disturbance, like magnetic field to acceleration, you measure the disturbance, and so now you can multiply these two numbers and subtract the contribution and check that the noise indeed is generated by this source. Where you cannot do that, uh, you can try to estimate uh, from the model the contribution and uh, uh, measure the in orbit the relevant parameter you need to do this estimate, and then add up everything, and the situation is very close to what you do with a a ground-based interferometer, at the end you have to calculate all the contribution of the noise and there's some must agree within the error with your uh, measurement of the overall noise. If you do that, then you have now a quantitative model that allows you to extrapolate at least, uh, almost uh, another order of magnitude uh, below what you have measured. And so I'll give you a few examples of that. Uh, I told you that we carry these uh, micro thrusters to keep the spacecraft with the test mass. These micro thrusters are noisy. Uh, this is a measurement of the noise of the micro thrusters uh, in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, it, the, the noise, the measurement bench is more noisy than the requirements, so we have only an upper limit to the noise of this. Uh, uh, so, what do we do if they are uh, too noisy? I mean, uh, and actually, the noise on the spacecraft is dominated by this effect. And so, why do we care, right? Because uh, there is no, oops, sorry. There is no contact between the spacecraft and the test mass, so why you care that the spacecraft jitters? The reason why you care is that there is always a gradient of force uh, where the test mass is, either because of gravitational field or because of magnetic field. Now, the gradient is like a spring. It's worse than a spring because it's a negative spring. But basically, when you move the spacecraft, you compress the spring, and the spring is going to push your test mass. So if the spacecraft jitters around the test mass, and your gradient is not zero and will not be zero, uh, you will have a problem of an extra force. Uh, in Lisa Pathfinder, you have to spring by this is a detail. Uh, also, uh, as I say, uh, you would like to measure the test mass to test mass relative acceleration, but in reality, because your light is reflected on the optical bench, you're measuring these two uh, displacements, and uh, maybe their calibration is not perfect, perfectly equal. And so instead of measuring the difference between uh, these two coordinates, you're 
mixing in a little bit one of the two coordinates, so the jitter of, of this spacecraft relative to this test mass. And why is the problem? That is that the jitter of the spacecraft relative to the test mass is nanometer, while the, the relative motion of this test mass is expected to be 10 picometer. So this is a huge effect, and even a small uh, mixing up will give you a problem. So, um, and, and uh, actually there have been quite a, quite a few analyses and also estimates of what this coefficient could be, and uh, it's not uh, impossible that it turns to be a fraction of a per thousand. And so to do, uh, what can you do? Well, you can, uh, you measure the motion of the spacecraft with this local interferometer, and, and so you can uh, subtract the motion uh, from the differential link, and we have uh, simulated that, and so the motion of the spacecraft is this huge thing here, uh, many nanometer per root hertz, and the motion, the relative motion of the best mass is something which is as slow as a fraction of, of uh, a few picometer at high frequency, and so uh, if there is a coupling, this motion will show, and it shows here in a little bit here. And, and when you convert everything to acceleration, if you don't do anything, the motion of the spacecraft reflects in excess noise here, but if you measure the motion of the spacecraft and subtract from the data, uh, then you get to a much lower thing. And the most important thing is not that you're going to claim that you have a much better mission, is that now you have uh, univocally attributed the noise to the shaking of the spacecraft. Obviously to do that, you have, I think I'll speed up, to do that you have to measure a lot of parameters, you have to measure force gradient, you have to measure the cross slope, you have to do uh, the calibration of everything, and uh, it turns out uh, this is a, a quite complex system where you measure two, uh, you have two signals, which is the measurement of the relative distance of the two test masses. Then you have many actuators because you, have, you can do force on the spacecraft or you can do force on the test mass through the electrostatics. And you have a closed loop because you're controlling your spacecraft uh, to follow the test mass. And because, uh, and because you cannot follow two test mass at once on Pathfinder, not in Lisa, you're forced to uh, put a little force on the second test mass. So if the first test mass moves, uh, the second test mass must follow. And you're, you're forced to apply a little electrostatics. And then the spacecraft turns on the, uh, the thrusters to follow the first test and uh, the, uh, the um, consequence of that is that I agree. The consequence of that is that you have a you need an electrostatic suspension for one or two test masses, and so the dynamics of this system is that everybody is following test mass one. So basically, there is a reference frame of test mass one, and both the spacecraft and test mass two are following uh, that reference frame. And so, if you play the engineer. Uh, uh, role, you have a system that has three physical inputs that are the thrusters and the electrostatic actuation and two signals and you have to measure the transfer function among all these things and the coefficient that enters in everything. And you can do by uh, applying stimuli, so by applying a signal in the drag free loop you can shift the spacecraft around the test mass and for instance measure the force gradient and we have uh, enough resolution to have hopes to measure the gravitational gradient, at least to put an upper limit to the gravitational gradient, which is a, a very important anchoring point for our gravitational calculation. And we think we will be able to calibrate the thrusters and uh, calibrate the actuation and uh, get the cross talk and, uh, and, as I say, measure the force gradient on board the tank. And that gives you another flavor. And uh, obviously, these are. These are correlated parameters, but I, you don't have to go into these details. Um, I give you a second example of uh, identifying the source of noise. As I say, uh, Lisa Pathfinder, unfortunately, in Lisa, you can follow one test mass with one spacecraft. Actually, you have two uh, test masses on board one spacecraft, but you're basically following one in one direction and the other one in the other direction. That's easy. But here, you have two test masses. That are that move in the same direction. At least you're interested in the in the relative motion in the same direction. So you cannot follow both test masses with your spacecraft. This test mass must be forced, and it's forced with an electric force whose main purpose is to we now know is to compensate the gravitational field on board. So there is a gravitational field uncompensated that pushes the test masses, and you apply an electric field to compensate for uh, this gravitational field. And this is noise. And you cannot turn off this electronic because if you turn off, the test mass flies away. 
So what do you do to turn off the electronics and measure what is the noise of the electronics? What you do, you do parabolic flight in one nano G, right? So you, you give kicks of force, and uh, basically you can think that your nano G force is, uh, is showing the down, right? And so you kick the best mass uh, in the air, and, and when it, it comes back, you give a kick. So you have uh, short times where you're kicking the test mass uphill, and very long time where the test mass is doing the parabolic flight uh, with no applied force on the test mass. And, uh, and so we have uh, the preliminary calculations show that you should be able, so this is a, 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 a simulation on how the test mass should move and go to a steady state where it's doing this parabolic flight all the time. And you can subtract uh, the parabola, you can fit and subtract the parabola. The, the parabola is noisy, obviously, but you can subtract and fit. And the residual, I'm sorry, this is cut, and the residual indeed shows uh, that you can subtract this electronic noise. And again, it's not to show that you have reached a lower level, it's to show that you have identified the source of noise, measured the source of noise, and so you can take out one of these boxes of the um, noise budget. And, and we do this with uh, many other disturbances, so we carry a lot of actuators, magnetometers, we, call, we carry magnetic coil to measure the force that the magnetic field gives on test mass, we, call, we, we carry thermometers and the heaters, and uh, we carry a chart pack for counter and so on. So obviously, I have to spend one minute on the data analysis because uh, this is an off topic. Um, uh, there is a huge effort to set up the data analysis before the mission flies, which is a new thing in, uh, in the space business. And the reason is that this is, as I say, this is a sequence of investigation. We have no hope whatsoever of being experimentalists that the thing will go as expected. And so uh, there is a short term and a medium term replanning of the mission timeline. And, and to do this replanning, we have to analyze what we got from the, those experiments. So this is growing into a major effort of, a, uh, of a, um, a data analysis tool that must be, uh, that must, that must uh, trace everything. Uh, I mean, you cannot run any analysis without tracing every detail you have done, including the software version uh, you have used so that, any, uh, that anybody can retrace what you have done. Uh, the, uh, the analysis can be run through a graphic user interface, this one that I was showing here. So this can be shown on the screen in the uh, Science Operations Center, so that everybody uh, has control of what is happening and, uh, and uh, decision can be taken by the team. But obviously the downside of that is that this, hard, this software is now uh, operation center software and so it must be accepted by ESA and has to go through uh, to our testing and the uh, team doing this grew up to uh, an unexpected size uh, in a very short time. And you see here now we are trying to infect the entire um, uh, the entire consortium doing Lisa Buckfinder uh, using this data analysis with their data in the lab so that all the data in the lab are usable uh, during the mission to compare with the uh, flight results. And so you see here, for instance, the testing, end-to-end -end testing of the optical metrology done in, in, in uh, Hanover with uh, Astrium and uh, AI Hanover, where the data analysis is used. And, and so now all the lab that are working and, and trying to our torsion handling trend that I'll talk to you later, it's also taking the data in this environment of the LTP data analysis. And so now all the results are tracked and are traceable and are retrievable uh, from the uh, center or whoever has to reanalyze the data. Uh, uh, finally, let me conclude where we stand with this model. I mean, what can we do before we fly Pathfinder and how big is the jump from what we know on ground and what we're going to investigate on Pathfinder? Uh, let me talk of uh, the forces that act on the test mass directly. This uh, roughly fall in two broad categories, surface forces that are mostly originated in the surrounding of the test masses and volume forces like uh, magnetics or gravitation. And these are, uh, uh, there isn't much you can do on those except doing simulation. For instance, this is a, a gigantic simulation of the gravitational field fluctuation on board the spacecraft due to the thermal distortion of the spacecraft, showing that anyhow we are compatible even with these requirements. 
but we can do a lot about the forces that are, you know, it's the nightmare of this community. What are these mysterious forces that act on the surface of a test mass and accelerate the test mass away from the gravitational trajectory? And it turned out that uh, there is a trick you can play here to uh, simulate free flight on the ground. And the trick is to make your test mass part of a torsion pendulum and surround with a disturbing environment, with this your GRS. And the torsion pendulum, as you know, uh, gives a very good isolation of the test mass and it's also a very good dynamometer. So if there are disturbances generated inside here, they will shake the test mass in the horizontal plane and uh, will show up as an excess torque on the on the on the pendulum. Uh, this technique has developed quite a bit, so this has now become a flight hardware testing facility. It's uh, operated in clean room, and we are now testing a uh, flight spare uh, on this thing. So we carry the witness sample, and we carry the. Uh, it has become a, from a physics technique to a, a flight hardware testing technique. So, for instance, here you see a, a flight spare of the GRS being assembled in the torsion pendulum is a very uh, pretty complicated the hardware and then it goes under a high vacuum and uh, uh, I mean uh, and, and it's part of the formal test is under configuration control and so on. However for uh, many years this torsion pendulum has allowed us to test many different effects. For instance many of you knows about that uh, the, the real terrible nightmare of everybody in this field are these charge patches. Charge patches are, uh, it's outside the, the screen here, there is a, a, a cartoon of a, uh, of a metal surface which is not at the same electrical potential. Because of the difference in work function or contamination and so on, uh, an, uh, a metallic surface is not at all uh, um, an equipotential electrical surface, it's a, a surface of uh, equal chemical potential, but not of just electrical potential. And so it, the essence of that is that any metal surface can be told as permanently charged, uh, and that's why the people call charge patches. And uh, with a torsion pendulum, we could measure indeed, we could uh, simulate, we could change the potential of test mass and see if the change of the potential of test mass indeed produces an attraction toward these charge patches that it did, and so we we discovered long ago that uh, these charge patches are of order many tens of millivolts. But even more important, we discovered that by applying voltages to the electrodes, we can compensate for them until we uh, see the, tor the, the force on the test mass to disappear, like here. This is uh, basically the force on the test mass, and by applying uh, proper bias to this. Uh, and so we now know that we can mitigate the effect of uh, electric field that are not under our control. Another notorious problem is are they stable at all or uh, nature is so malignant that uh, they change in time and there have been measurement, uh, this uh, measurement done with distortion panel, there has been another measurement done in Seattle with a specialized panel that showed that this uh, charge patches seems to be stable enough to be compatible certainly with Lisa Batfinder but also with Lisa. In flight, we will measure all these things. So this is another example where we, we will anchor this thing in flight. In, on the real test mass, we can only do in flight because the real test mass is too heavy to put in the torsion pendulum. And so you see how an experiment on ground like this one is paralleled by an experiment uh, uh, on orbit. And you can measure this famous force gradient with the, with the pendulum. For instance, there is a force gradient every Every time you put an electric field in between the test mass and the electrode, there is a force gradient. And you can see this here. We, we have a motor that allows us to move the electrode around the test mass. And if there is a force gradient, then the test mass follows. And that's what is happening here. Here, the electric field of the GRS uh, used to sense the position of the test mass is on. And so by moving the motor back and forth, we see the test mass moving. I'm sorry you don't see the scale, but these are microns. So you see the test mass moving, and then when you turn off the electric field, the test mass doesn't move anymore because the, electric, the gradient is very low. So this way we have measured the electric gradient. Uh, we have shown that uh, it indeed is linear in the small the interval where we, and it's quadratic in the electric field and all this thing. And this now has, been, uh, uh, has become a technique to verify all the electrical parameters of the of the GRS and the uh, uh, finite element calculation made by 
asked them, confirmed, and are anchored by this thing. And I think this has been very valuable to do the fine design of the mission. Another, I give you uh, almost my last example, which is uh, uh, molecular impacts. Uh, one, one notorious phenomenon is so-called radiometer effect. If you have hot molecules hitting this space and cold molecule hitting this space, the momentum transfer is different, it's asymmetrical, and this gives the force to the test mass. Uh, in addition, there were, we were all afraid that you could have some extra outgassing due to the non-perfect cleanliness of the surfaces, and because outgassing from surfaces is an activated process, is very sensitive to, to, to temperature. And with a torsion panel, you can apply a gradient, and you can apply a, a temperature gradient and see the test mass moving, and indeed, uh, uh, besides the oscillation of the pendulum, you see the test mass following the thermal gradient, and so you can measure uh, uh, how much the thermal gradient excites the motion of the test mass, and uh, you cannot see the scales, but this is pressure and the force, and uh, this is what you expect from the Knudsen model. Actually, you have to do simulation to really have the theory, and, and uh, the agreement with the theory is within the resolution. And so now we have a model to anchor this phenomenon. And even more important, the uh, outgassing uh, fear has been uh, tamed and is uh, well below the requirement. I'm sorry, you're missing 10% of the screen there. Uh, um, still in the impact of molecules, very recently with the torsion pendulum, we have discovered that uh, uh, viscous friction of the residual gas, which is very low, very low pressure, is 10 to minus 7 millibar. It's much higher than what had, uh, has been estimated uh, before. In hindsight, it's an obvious thing. When the test mass moves in this constrained geometry, the gas must flow around the test mass, and this gives uh, an, extra, uh, an extra friction. And if you compare the extra friction, we're talking a factor 20. That means that uh, the thermal noise due to the viscous damping is uh, a factor five or six larger than expected. And indeed, we detected the thermal noise. And uh, here, I think uh, you compare the damping factor from the thermal noise with the damping factor measured, then they are in very good agreement. And so this has allowed us, for instance, this had been overlooked. Uh, it would not have been a problem for Pathfinder, but would have been a problem for Lisa, but fortunately, uh, we have put a, a, a mask on, in our uh, noise model uh, pretty close to Pathfinder requirement, and so we should be able to uh, finally anchor the model for Lisa. And so if you look uh, where you end with this, uh, this is the upper limit to acceleration put by this pendulum measurement, and with the latest, uh, with the most sophisticated pendulum we could come with, for with a beautiful silica fiber made for us from the University of Glasgow, uh, the pendulum becomes, became so sensitive that we are now, uh, we are putting an upper limit to any surface disturbance very close to uh, Lisa Pathfinder requirement. And so the risk for Pathfinder to discover huge unexpected thing has been uh, severely reduced. And so at the end of all this story, uh, these are the Pathfinder requirement, and these are the LISA requirement. And uh, we already think that we should be a little better of the requirement. And then with this uh, noise projection uh, procedure, we should be able to say, well, uh, whatever we cannot explain is smaller than this line here, which is uh, roughly a factor two uh, from, the, from the measured one. And if you compare with the LISA requirement, you got quite close uh, to the final requirement. And so uh, I stole this graph from Paul, and I think this is a, a pretty accurate list of all the people that are working to this project. This uh, turned to be a quite difficult project, to be honest. And, but I think once we are through this, uh, Lisa becomes uh, real and uh, immediately physical. And uh, I'm not going to show you the additional slide. Thank you. This one is the single test mass torsion pendulum, and so is 500 seconds. 
uh, one that is called 2 millihertz, right? I'm just curious how much this data is highly computed, right? Uh, not really, because the motion is, is large. Motion. The motion is large, that's why it doesn't show the noise. Okay, so there's yeah. no it, No, no, it's not a heavy feature. No, it's just that it's a wide range. Okay. Yeah, yeah, look, it's a 10 microwatt. And usually the noise is, um, you know, many nanowatts. So, Stefano, I always uh, hear how much, like, Lisa, is a part time on the D, but I've recently been wondering about the converse. So, how much, like, Lisa part time will Lisa be in the sense of um, the availability of <clears throat> actuation systems and measurement systems on board? during the commissioning phase to essentially do a lot of the part-time studies to measure all the transfer functions and, and uh, you know, how well we might understand the least of noise, um, even from ground testing and then in flight, um, doing these kinds of things with Lisa. Well, I think in the formulation study, where is Alberto Carson? In the formulation study, it's clear that we have to carry all this diagnostic for Lisa too. I mean, that uh, Lisa can find the results of tests of Lisa commissioning. I think even uh, even more is uh, is a test on how we tame the systematics that will not be tamed at once at the beginning. You know, the test mass will keep charging up, or uh, you will lose this alignment, that alignment. So it, it looks like we are learning how the maintenance will be and how we have to pre-process the data or you know give an input to the uh, post-processing of the data to get a clear data it, obviously we're talking because you know we have to see but that's what uh, my intuition tells me and, and many other people tell uh, but certainly we need to carry uh, a few critical diagnostic like thermometers all, all over the place and So, so when you say that the molecular uh, thermal noise is higher than that's a, that's a given pressure, presumably. Which yeah, yeah. It's, so, so how, how could the model be off by so much? What, what's, what's causing that? Oh, in, in hindsight, I mean, you, you feel an idiot, right? Because it's, uh, uh, I mean, we had calculated for the term effect that this four millimeter channel has a certain molecular impedance right now if you move the test mass you have flow in that molecular impedance now if you have flow through an impedance you have dissipation right because the impedance is a real impedance so you develop a pressure difference and pressure times flow gives you a dissipation and that's what the simulation gives you and, and actually the the simula this uh, simulation with diffuse scattering is what the people uh, use to calculate molecular conductances in, in vacuum pipes, and they are the perfect tool, and they reproduce the effect to the, to the second digit. Uh, actually, uh, Jens showed us some measurement made with their torsion pendulum, this uh, special torsion pendulum, uh, uh, recently in Seattle, where also him, with his uh, simulation, gets the number on the data. Right? So in hindsight, we would have, we should have talked uh, talk to them. Honestly, there are also uh, there is quite a misunderstanding about even the friction in a totally open volume. I think you find any kind of formula in the literature, and they are all optimistic. So the closest formula we could find was from a guy doing um, a, a motion of a little bowl, a magnetic suspended bowl to measure pressure that disagreed with our calculation within, uh, by a small factor. And we now know from the simulation that the formula we finally got based on all this work is the right one. So there was a lot of misunderstanding there, but this effect is, is an extra effect. It's uh, in close geometry, you have this flow. But it's not something you understand in the model. Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, perfect. And, and, uh, uh, even more important, we now trust the calculation. So I think now the calculation is a good engineering tool. You do this simulation and uh, you get the number. Right. How do you fix How do you fix it? There, there was a question. Yes. In the last time that the generates is the medium. Thank you. 
I can tell you with uh, with a closed geometry around a solid body like a cubic test mass or a spherical test mass or whatever, in order to get below the Lisa requirement of 10 to minus 5 Pascal, uh, you have to go to centimeter gap. Right? And so if you go to centimeter gap, then you need some actuation system because uh, even Lisa Pathfinder is marginal from the point of view of actuation authority. With 100 volt, the maximum force you can do is very low, and so you're, you know, you have to find out a different actuation system. And, however, to be honest, uh, uh, after we discovered that in the formulation study, Aster made a, a, a pretty good survey of what is the vacuum available if you put a pipe outside, based on Rosetta study, and it looks you can go even to 10 to minus seven or eight Pascal, and we only need 10 to minus six. So I think. Pressure is the way to go. I wouldn't mess with the geometry if pressure is, uh, is, is not a big problem. Once you know, right? Sailing is easy when you know the ropes. <laughs> As it's written there, right? It's a Galileo quote. <laughs> okay, um, there's no more questions. Uh, there was a question from Ricardo. Okay, so we have wine and cheese in the library, um, and join me in thanking Stefano again for a very nice talk.